10 systems to simplify and scale your business. Um, again, my name is Jacob Lawler. I am the branch manager for the Mission Viejo office right here at First Team Real Estate. Quick background, um, I was a former top producer before getting into management. Um, I also ran a very successful team here with the company, um, but really I look at myself as an agent builder. I'm all about how can I help you generate more business for yourself but to be completely honest, above all else, I'm a family guy. Yes, uh, this is my incredible family. It's not a stock photo of awesome people, um, but uh, that's really what I'm doing this for is to help legal, leave a legacy for my kids and you know, help try to make some awesome things happen for my beautiful wife. But uh, what I'm here today is I'm here for you because I think we can all agree that this business is tough. There's a lot of things to do. We have clients to call, searches to set up, showings to schedule, listings to market, social media posts that we have to read and do all that fun stuff, emails to read. Um, and even on top of that, uh, I've been getting tons and tons of emails, I don't know about you guys, over the last couple of days of the 10 uh, special things technology can do to help grow your business. And I even got one from Riz Media literally an hour ago of their upcoming webinar on how technology can increase our efficiencies uh, in our business. And it, we have distractions on top of distractions. And I don't know about you, but for me, that leads to overwhelm of what the heck do I actually need to do? Um, so I, I plan to uh, help give you guys uh, some clarity on some of these, but one of the big things that I have found is that we really have decision fatigue. Um, you guys, if you've done any studying of like some of the top uh, billionaires in the world, but mo most of them set up systems to simplify their life. It, even to the point of Steve Jobs very famously had the black turtleneck and blue jeans every single day of his life because it was one less decision that he had to make. Same thing with Mark Zuckerberg, uh, jeans and a gray t-shirt every single day. That sometimes we really just need some clarity in our business um, because if you don't have clarity, we don't know, because uh, we've heard the phrase, right? Um, we've heard the phrase of discipline equals freedom. And oftentimes I get either number one, a negative connotation with discipline, but I would uh, argue and uh, debate you on that in terms of the negativity of that. But oftentimes when I hear is Jacob, I don't know what to be disciplined about. It seems like the market's changing, the industry's changing. Do I need to worry about this Google My Business thing? Do I need to worry about Zillow taking over the world, which we can have that discussion. We can have all these different things that sometimes we just need clarity on what to focus on and what to do. Because when we don't know what's important, everything becomes important. And I don't know if anybody can relate to that, but I certainly can, where if I notice I'm getting distracted, it's because I'm not reminding myself of what actually moves the needle. And in order to not have to make these decisions every single day and every single transaction, that's where we need systems. That's the topic of today's talk. And uh, if you Google right now, system, Google comes back with a set of principles or procedures according to which something is done, an organized framework or method. That's really what I wanna harness today is a set of principles or procedures according to which something is done. Because let's not forget we are salespeople we get paid based upon results. Results come from execution, completion, getting something done. And what we're planning on doing today is helping outline a set of principles and procedures to help you win more business. Hopefully, that's something that you want to get ingrained with. One thing I want to, dis uh, I want to dispel is systems are not just a technology. Because technology is an extension of the fundamentals. I think Fred said this two weeks ago during his business planning. I wrote that down. I, I, I want to give him credit, but I don't know 100% if it was him that said it. Technology is an extension of the fundamentals, not a replacement for the fundamentals. And don't worry, we are getting into technology today. 
We're getting into specific programs, but I don't want you to focus on the technology being the answer to a systems problem because technology can accelerate or multiply a system, but you can't multiply something that's not there because zero times anything is still zero. So then what the heck do I mean by systems? What I mean by systems is that set of procedures, specifically what you do, how you do it, and when you do it. So hopefully that makes some sense. It brings some clarity to what we're talking about today. We are getting into technology on how to accelerate, but we first have to have the systems set up before we get into the weeds of technology. Because I don't know about you guys, but I have signed up for so many 14-day free trials. I have, I have accounts to programs that I forget that I'm paying monthly for. We have 40 plus different tools and technologies already paid for by the brokerage that each of us have. And how many of us haven't even opened them or logged in? Because the problem isn't the technology because the technology changes on a friggin' daily basis. We were just as managers uh, uh, on Friday talking about awesome, awesome things coming down the line. My biggest concern is even if this incredible technology comes in, do we know what we're gonna use it for, how we're gonna use it, and when we're gonna implement it in our business? And that's what I wanna focus on today. So when we have these incredible things roll out, you already know how to plug it in. So today, what I wanna give you guys a big challenge and kind of the theme is to take the time to write down your systems and commit to executing those systems. Because on the roadmap right now, you can download PDF checklists on what to do when you get a listing, right? You can download PDF checklists of every single area of your business, but most of us don't implement those because there's one or two items that we might not do, or one or two items that we might not believe in, or this, that, or whatever. So I want you guys to really think about taking the time now or as you want to implement your systems and write down what those are. Because the number one thing I hear when I talk to an agent about potentially hiring an assistant or maybe a showing assistant or buyer's agent is oftentimes the agent will say, well, I don't know what I should have them do. If I hire an assistant, what do they do all day? That's concerning to me because why would you bring someone in to chaos? So the first step is we have to bring some systems, that set of principles or procedures designed to implement and get something done. Uh, one of the quotes that is about financial advice, but is very poignant to what I'm talking about today is from Dave Ramsey, like him or not, believe in his advice or not. Uh, it's if you will live like no one else, later you can live like no one else. So if you take the time now, you invest the time now to set up your systems and create your own standard operating procedures, if you will, of how you do your business, then you can scale because without the system, you can't scale or else it just becomes chaos because having the systems will let you have your best day every day. It allows you to have your best transaction every transaction. So enough of the fluff, let's get into the actual 10 systems, right? The 10 systems to simplify and scale your business. Step one is your database. Yes, we all know about it. Yes, we all hate hearing about it, but database is really the most important system. Uh, when you think of database, I don't, again, I don't want you to think about the technology, okay? Because we have KV Core, which is one of the premier contact relation management systems available today. But many of us don't even know our password to get in because we don't know what to use it for, what to do with it. When you think of database, think of a home base for your data. The home base for your data. Where is all of the information? All of the people who you've met throughout your career and all of the people you plan on meeting, where is their information? 
And in reality, it's the only thing of real value that we have. If you think about selling your business down the line, what do you really have to sell besides your database? And a lot of people can say, well, maybe my farm area. And that's just a geographic database. You have the information of those people. You have that built-in equity and relationship. But our database is that thing of real value and not just names and numbers. You can go to Western Resources Title and for six cents a piece, 12 cents a piece, if you want their emails too, you can get name, phone number, email address of every single person in a geographical area. It's not just the information. It's not just the lead. We can go how many companies are selling us, you know, you know, two dollars per lead. Uh, Facebook ads, whether it's bold leads or any of those other ones, it's not the name and the phone number. It's what we use it for. And that can be on paper. That can be on Excel. That could even be as incredible as a KV Core CRM. I know, and I talked to her before this and I asked her permission, right? Uh, but I know uh, Sharon Custer, one of the num one of the top agents in the company, about her database and her follow up system. She still uses the Dale Carnegie three by five index cards sorted by name, and sh that's her system. That's her database of clientele. So it doesn't have to be some super fancy thirty three touch auto sequence. You just have to have a home base for your data. And three questions I want you guys to ask of yourself is, do you have a real business or do you just have a cash flow? Meaning, do you have an actual standing business? Could you remove yourself and things still operate it? Or do you just have a cash flow? Meaning you sell houses, you make money, okay? What is your business worth right now? If somebody were to come in brand new as an agent, but maybe had some money because of prior investments or prior um, executive level positions that they had, and they wanted to buy, buy somebody's business like CPAs and a lot of other professionals do to get up and running, what would your business be worth? And what will your business be worth when you're done selling houses? Because oftentimes I hear, well, I'm just getting started. My business is worth none, but I got a database. But what will it be worth when you're done? And what could it be worth when you're done? Because we do have KV Core. I'm a, I, KV Core is the premier CRM program, and it is broker paid for. So we all have access to an incredible, incredible system. And on top of that, there's in, in tons of training and even uh, our first team freelancers that will help set it up for you and with you. So don't let the technology be the hindrance. You already have an incredible one. Personal recommendation, at least start on Excel because Excel can go and input anywhere, but you can also export from, from KV Core. So it's personal preference, but at least have a home base for your data. Second system, is what is your system for maintaining your market knowledge? What is your system for maintaining your market knowledge? Um, Mark Kojak has a, has a great quote. He has two great quotes. Number one is if you're going to do something, do it right, right? And the second one is be the most knowledgeable agent anyone has ever met. So on a national level, one of the greatest resources that we have that is free, but you can also pay for personalized versions of their market information is keeping current matters. They talk on a national level and they get into housing, but also macroeconomics. So if you wanna know national, awesome, there's one, okay? On a county level, my favorite personally is Stephen Thomas's reports on housing. He does the five Southern California um, counties, and he puts it out every other week with a full report. And every Friday, he does a free Facebook Live. If you're not a part of that, you're missing the boat. And then, of course, on a local level, making sure you understand the FAST stats. Uh, here in Orange County, they have OC FAST stats, but I know they have other ones in different counties where it's literally a one sheet of an area that just talks about what things are year over year differences. 
Okay. Then of course the MLS, we can't get around the number one thing that we have access to is the MLS and inside tracked. If you guys are not subscribers to inside tracked, you're missing the boat because this has floor plans for when these properties were built and how awesome and knowledgeable do you come across when you not only have the sales data, but also information from the building track uh, from the builder themselves to have all of the floor plans to have what those different models are what streets and sometimes they even have the brochure material of what they actually used to use uh, on a builder level there. Um, you know, our local, as an example, our local market statistics, we've had just under 2,300 sales in the last 90 days. 80% of them are selling at or above list price. Our average list to sales price ratio is 102.5%. And this is a seven mile radius here around our office that I keep track of. Average selling $25,000 above list, median days on market of seven, and only 2.9% have sold for 95% or less than the list price. And the average of those are 67 days on the market. How well do you know your local marketplace? Averages are great, but sometimes it's really helpful to go into specifics. So as an example, being able to say the ratio of list to close price of specific properties and showing not only is it averaging 25% difference, but also looking at some of these that are $200,000 difference, $150,000 difference, but showing it's not just averages, but specific case by case scenarios and knowing that for your market. Uh, the two best tools at our disposal truly are trend graphics and market trends. If you guys are not leveraging trend graphics and market trends, you're really missing the boat. If you don't know how to use them, uh, Bob McCullough did a phenomenal phenomenal training on March 24th. Uh, take a look at the uh, Together We're First Team Loop. Awesome, awesome training, not only uh, on what to do, but also how to spin it, how to speak to it. Uh, if you haven't looked at that, you're definitely missing the boat. Uh, third system is time management. Time management, uh, this is one of the biggest challenges that we have. Um, our schedule. Uh, I hear a lot, it's not enough time in the day. Anyone else just feel busy? versus getting things done. Uh, there's a huge difference when you become hyper cognizant of your time on being effective versus doing a lot of things. Are you busy or are you being effective? And that's really doing a lot of things versus doing the right things. Um, oftentimes, uh, I will be fully transparent. Uh, oftentimes, it, it really comes down to having a small pipeline. Because the, as your pipeline increases, meaning your book of business that is upcoming, which we're going to get into when it comes to follow up and all of that, but the pipeline gives you that confidence in your business. If you have no business coming up, we will oftentimes sacrifice our time and sacrifice our core competency to do business somewhere else because we need to feel like we have a win. So as an example, uh, agents who don't usually do leases start taking lease tenants around looking for property or taking lease listings, and they don't have a system for doing leases. They've never done leases before or taking listings in mobile home parks when they have no idea what they're doing in mobile home parks. Usually agents who have a large book of business won't do those things if it's not their core competency. Don't get me wrong. There's agents who make a great living doing leases and doing mobile home parks and all that, but that's what they do. So it comes down to lead evaluation, having a pipeline that gives you the confidence to say no to people and not in a negative way, but refer them out and ensure that they get great service. Because sometimes when we go outside of our core competency, we're doing it for us. We're not doing it for them if that makes sense. And really coming down to time blocking and protecting that time block is so huge. But I'll be honest, the underlying reasons why we really have time management problems is we don't have the right priorities. We don't know the right things for us to do. And oftentimes it's because we don't have enough business 
that we start trying to do anything and everything to get any type of business. And I don't know about you guys, but whenever I've had that challenge, I've usually met the clients from hell. Am I the only one where they run you all around? They're angry. They ask you to discount things. They don't appreciate you. It's usually the worst transactions of your career. In terms of the actual how-tos, uh, a very simplistic one is using an at-a-glance they used to be, I remember when I first started, uh, they, they, it was sold by a company called Boss. There was an at-a-glance folder, even the, the older school Franklin Covey style. Um, and then the next level is having a Google Calendar. Uh, if you guys aren't all using your Google Calendar that's available to you from being uh, awesome agents with an incredible company like ours of First Team, uh, you guys all have access to a Google Calendar. And a higher level step is a nested calendar within your CRM where things plug and auto uh, schedule meetings for you and all of that, but at least start on your Google Calendar. Um, You'd be surprised at how many how many of even the younger agents, and I'll say younger in age, because we think millennials and Gen Z have technology down. So many agents have no idea how to use the Google Calendar. They'll know how to use Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok, but ask them to set up a calendar invite on Google, and they start crossing their eyes a little bit. Um, as an example of a time block, I want to exact, at least give you an idea of like a sample perfect day, not everyone's perfect day, but here's a sample to give you an idea. Um, if you wake up at six, from six to eight, your morning routine. If you wake up from five, five to eight, five to seven, whatever you want to do, but at least have a morning routine where you get your head right. From eight to 11, do some sort of outbound lead generation, whether that be calling your sphere of influence, whether that be uh, walking your farm area and reaching out to people, whether that be anything that is outbound where you can control how many attempts you make. Some people, this is their favorite time to cold call if they're a cold caller. Some people, that's their favorite time to walk their farm area, whatever works for you, but some sort of outbound lead generation from eight to 11 lunch slash debrief with yourself. Because if you're doing a lot of calls, because three hours of calls, that's a lot. Uh, if you're doing that much, your desk is going to turn into a paper disaster zone of taking notes on leads and doing this. You take that hour period to collect yourself, debrief, how did it go, get some lunch. From 12 to 3, any admin related activities prepping for any appointments you might have later that day or the following day, or role play your scripts and dialogue. From three to five, appointment number one. Yes, appointment number one, that implies appointment number two, because appointments are the lifeblood of a top producer schedule. And if you don't have any appointments, go out for another round of prospecting to get the business. Appointment number two from five to seven, or if you don't have any appointment number two, do some more follow-up where you're reaching out to clientele. And then from 7 p.m., you get home, you turn off your phone and you be with your family. Yes, I specifically said turn off your phone or at least put it away because you've earned it. If you've done that schedule, you've earned the right to be off. Many of us work on holidays, Many of us work while we're at home because we subconsciously have that guilty feeling that we didn't do everything we could while we were working. So that's a subconscious thing that something to think about. <laughs> yes, every single day or at least five days a week. Imagine if you did this schedule 70% of the time. Would your business improve? I think it would. Uh, system number four, lead generation. This is always a hot topic. Everybody wants to talk about lead generation. What are the best lead gen services? Let's talk about lead generation. Uh, it's the lifeblood of our business. If you're not doing lead generation on a consistent business, your business will decline. It might not right now, but our business usually works on a 90 to 120 day in advance schedule. One of the fallacies we have is that while we're doing business, this is a big thing with spouses too. I don't know about you guys, but I always battled with this is my wife would say, why are you working so hard? You have plenty of deals going on right now. 
And I was saying, yes, I did, but I'm thinking a quarter in advance. I'm looking at my pipeline. <laughs> I'm looking at a 90, 120, 180 days from now, and it's looking a little light, I'm getting anxiety, right? So if you're not having that consistent lead generation, you're gonna miss the boat, right? So lifeblood of our business. And my belief is that the true reason why we get paid so much money as a percentage of the transaction, meaning compared to lenders, compared to title reps, compared to escrow officers, compared to home warranty reps, all those what I'll call auxiliary uh, professionals. The reason why we get paid so much is because we are the engine of that transaction. We are the reason why that transaction is getting put together because we're interfacing with buyers and sellers on a daily basis. This is also why I believe we are in trouble because so many of us have either been led to believe or maybe just want to believe that we can outsource the lead generation to outside services but just know that as we start to fall back on our lead generation, we will start getting a less and less slice of the pie because we will have to pay out more and more referral fees and in turn make less money. And I don't know about you guys, I've never been in this business to make less money. Anyway, uh, that's talking to people about real estate. The, the bottom line, that was one thing that I learned from Fred, who was my, uh, my first manager when I first got started in the business almost 11 years ago now. Uh, he told, told me that the only definition of work in this business is talking to people about real estate. So however you do that, it all comes down to talking to people about real estate. Marketing versus prospecting. Marketing is putting content into the world into the universe and wanting a response back. That's every social media post that we spend hours planning out, every postcard we put out, every letter we put out. That's all content we're pushing out into the universe, hoping for a response versus prospecting, which is us going outbound and creating the conversation. So we all know which one's more effective. However, that's the scarier one. Uh, and your dialogue is key. Uh, I'll use as an example. Um, earlier, I think it was actually, it was last year, um, Philip DiMatteo was gracious enough to give us word for word what his I have a buyer letter was, where I believe the statistics were something like on one letter, he sent it out to his uh, area. I think it was like 1800 people. He got 24 responses and took nine listings. And everybody was all excited to do that. And a lot of agents did it, but I happen to know personally, a lot of agents blew those phone calls because they didn't know how to convert the phone call to an appointment. So your dialogue while you're doing lead generation is so key. So let's get into actual specifics, right? Top pillars of lead generation, sphere of influence. We all know that right? Sphere of influence, past clients. That's the number one driver of agent business, with, which also lets me know that that's a concern that a lot of agents aren't going out and getting new business. We're relying on people that we have known. And that is a definite small piece of the pie compared to what's available. A geographic farm, the most tried and true tested way to generate business the best way to generate listings. If you look at all of the top agents, the gross, overwhelmingly gross majority of them are geographic farmers, where they've been working in a narrow geographical area for years. And it's, I just look at it as a structured way of building relationships in a geographical location where all of your activities build upon them themselves, where you're holding open houses in the same area, you're putting marketing material in the same area. When you sell a buyer, that buyer wants to move to somewhere else where you have the seller, you make these connections, and they really become part of your sphere of influence. They just happen to be in a geographical area. 
Leveraging around your successes is one of the big ones that a lot of agents fail to make a system. They just happen to get a listing call off of their sign and they think that's just random. Having a system around how you leverage your business is so huge for building and scaling that business. Uh, I personally know of agents who have doubled their business in a year purely because they started systematically leveraging every success and every sale they had, whether it be a listing or a buyer. And then online advertisements and social media. I put it on there, but I'm a big believer that social media is there to help accelerate your success, not create it. Most agents get the most amount of lift on social media by broadcasting their success to build credibility of themselves. But more importantly than anything, it's engaging with your clients. Uh, but also online advertisements are great. Uh, most of them are buyer centric. The seller lead generation hasn't worked its kinks out. Could it? Maybe. Um, I'm also a big believer in um, the AdWorks style uh, display advertisements for people that you know, not to generate new business, but to stay in front of the people that you already know. So let's talk about lead follow-up. When I think about lead follow-up, I personally like to break it up into two categories. The initial follow-up, what do you do that anchors yourself with a client? I just call it the initial wow follow-up versus the continual follow-up. Um, as an example, um, one of the biggest challenges I think we can all agree is there are a lot of agents here, a lot. Uh, there's about 24,000 that I can see by trend graphics in Orange County alone. Uh, everybody has a brother, sisters, aunts, uncles, brothers, dog walkers, son who has a real estate license, right? And there's about 1.5 million realtors in the National Association of Realtors. And it's estimated anywhere like two and a half to three million non-realtors in the United States. But there's a lot of noise and it's vitally important that no matter what, we are remembered. That's where I think of the initial wow follow-up that helps anchor your initial meeting to that client because we only get one chance at a good first impression, right? We all know that. So the initial wow follow-up, what do you like to do? I'll give you some examples. My personal one was a handwritten note. And, and uh, if it was a female, and I'm going to be sexist for a second, and I apologize, but if it was a female, I would get, the, I would get her in, uh, an orchid. I would just go to pavilions. They're like 25 to 50 bucks, depending on the size. And I would write a handwritten note and give her an orchid and put it at the, the front doorstep. Um, I learned this note from Fred nearly 11 years ago uh, that he said, uh, it was a pleasure meeting you. I truly enjoyed our conversation. I look forward to helping you with any of your real estate needs. Please let me know if I could ever be of service. Very passive initial wow follow-up, but I can't tell you how many texts and emails and calls I have gotten over the years of saying, wow, that was so nice of you. We're not ready now, but when it comes time, we're calling you. Or, you know what? That was so awesome. We're not ready, but my friend or family member's thinking of doing something. So an initial wow follow-up versus the continual. What do you do in perpetuity? Um, uh, immediacy and urgency to get them committed to you. Because uh, one of the things is the follow-up system. Like how often do you follow up with them? My thought is as often, as frequently, and as relevant as possible until you get them committed to you. Then you can base the follow-up from there. So on a, on a seller, your initial goal is to help cross the threshold, get inside the house, because the dynamic totally changes when you get inside the house. And a buyer, a, an immediate goal is to get them looking at houses, which can lead to a consultation. Because I don't know about you guys, but it's hard in a marketplace to just say, hey, it's great to meet you. My name's Jacob Lawler. I want to help you buy a house. When can you come down and take 90 minutes and sit down at my office and have a dialogue about it? 
right? Sometimes with first time home buyers that works. Sometimes with buyers who are upset because they've missed out on so many offers, that might be a good hook. But more often than not, I'm seeing agents having success showing them property and doing a walking, talking consultation, if you will. Then, of course, we go through the first team follow-up sequence, right? Categorizing them based on their timeline, the A's, the B's, the C's, the D's, whether that's a daily phone call, a weekly phone call, a monthly phone call, or a quarterly phone call, right? And then your pipeline, which is your now business or your forward thinking, which first team has an incredible tool called the bubble sheet. If you guys haven't downloaded the bubble sheet or utilized it, that's how I was trained. That's how I, my brain works. Phenomenal, phenomenal system um, versus the nurture style of follow-up where they might be more longer term. Following up with them with multi-channels. Phone, the one we hate to use, but the most effective. Everybody just wants to text. I can't tell you how many times I've asked a, uh, an agent Oh, how did it go with your follow-up? Oh, I sent him a text. I didn't hear back. It's easy to text because the rejection is low. But you cannot sell via text. You cannot sell via email. The best way is to be in person, of course. But the second best to that, besides like a Zoom meeting or something like that, is having a phone call being able to dig a little bit deeper on what they're looking to do, when they're looking to move, why they're looking to move, where they're looking to go, things that are important to them. Because if you're just ping-ponging via text, anybody else get those little dot, dot, dots, and then they go away and you don't hear from them again, right? But text is important. It is the number one way to get attention and potentially a response. I keep seeing articles that say it's like a 98% read rate on text messages because it pops up right on their phone, right? Phenomenal for attention. Good for getting responses. Horrible to sell via text. If you're having to break bad news, for example, don't do it via text. It's tacky, right? Email, the tried and true, right? We all know about email. We have tons. Uh, the first team wire that comes out on a monthly basis. There's tons of opportunities uh, to do that. One thing I will say and caution against for email follow-up is I've noticed that the beautiful HTML looking don't get the responses that a very short, strategic, personalized message to them does. Uh, Chris Smith wrote a great book on the conversion code. If you haven't read it, do it. It's phenomenal for online lead generation, follow-up and conversion. Uh, we even had him come out to do a talk. Um, but the, the, when it comes to email specifically, that's a great book for doing that. Um, social, social media and display ads. So being able to stay in front of them, connecting with them on a social level so they see all the work that you do behind the scenes. It's not just that you're a pretty face and you do some cool work, you're effective. And it's a great way to stay in front of them. And I've heard story after story of agents never speaking with the client, but they reach out to them because they feel like they know them after a while of being on their friends list. And then physical mail, not the biggest person on that, but it's great to stay in front of them. And it's a multi-channel approach. Um, uh, like even if it's just like a monthly update of all of your sales or their relevant sales or what have you in there. But I'm a big believer in earning the right to mail people, meaning meeting them first and then following up via mail, as opposed to jumping in and starting to mail 10,000 people <laughs> EDDM and then having a huge budget, building that list over time. Uh, because I am a big believer that in the search for efficiency with technology, with social media, with all of this, we have sacrificed effectiveness. There's some people who have 10,000 people in their email database and they send emails to them once a week. How personal can you get with that? We're used to the generic. We're used to the sale, like how many things do you guys have in your inbox every single morning from companies sending out advertisements? It's because it's efficient, but with efficiency, we have sacrificed effectiveness. 
Don't discount the personal note. Don't discount the personalized gift, not something tacky with like your label on it that you're sending them a gift, but an actual gift. You know, I know an agent who, uh, when she met uh, a, a client at an open house, uh, she was pregnant and she was going to be due in the next month. In two weeks, she found out who the person was. She found out something that's important to them and sent them uh, like a baby onesie of the dad's favorite uh, football team. Sold them a house because it was personalized. It was that added level of unnecessary effort, if you will. Because as we start thinking efficiency, we sacrifice effectiveness. One of the hardest things to do when we talk about scaling is scaling effectiveness. But my favorite for all follow-ups, especially for buyers, is Real Scout. Because the number one thing buyers care about is property. I think we all can agree. More often than not, buyers will buy a house regardless of the agent, oftentimes, not every time, not your clients, your clients love you, but I'm saying <laughs> potentially other people's clients, but buyers want houses, putting product in front of people, okay? And sellers want product. That's why Zillow is such a behemoth of a company because it allows people living here in Orange County to look for properties in Chicago. That's what they're doing. And then eventually they look at selling their house as a means to an end. So maybe finding out where they want to go and seeing if you can find a great search platform or even just onesie twosies. Hey, I saw this one and thought of you. Next system is the listing process. This is where first team excels above all else is our listing process and listing systems. But what is your appointment setting strategy? Do you have mapped out what value could you bring to a client that you can say in a succinct, impactful way to cross that threshold? When you do have an appointment set, do you have a pre-appointment process? Do you have a pre-listing book? The answer is yes. It's at the marketingstore.firstteam.com. Do you have a personalized one? If that's your hindrance, some people say, well, I don't want a generic. I want it personalized to me. Cool. Do you have one? No, get one. Or use the generic until you have your personalized. Your presentation, how many, Bob Gattuso just did a phenomenal presentation about three weeks ago on the listing presentation. If you were getting a phone call right now saying, can you be at my house in an hour to give me a listing presentation? How many of you are prepared for it? Do you have a system of how you prepare homes for market? Meaning, do you have a stager that you can call that you know on a first name basis? Do you have vendors, a handyman? Do you have people that you can call? Because one of the things that people love to work with are other people who are, of course, similar to them, but people who are well-connected. Having a trusted, not even just a trusted vendors list, because everybody says that, call it a strategic partner list. Do you have your system, your process for how you, as a professional, prepare the home for market? Your photographer, do you have your system that you can outline to them on how you prepare their home for the market? Do you have your pre-marketing dialed in? How, do you send email blasts? Do you send coming soon messages? Do you have online ads that you run? Whatever it is, I don't necessarily care exactly what it is, but I care that you have something and it's your system. It's your process. How do you schedule showings? Do you prep clients in advance for how you schedule showings? Do you get their available timeframes in advance? Or do you have like one of our incredible agents, Kathy Van Hoften said, which she might be upset that I'm sharing it to everyone, but she shared it in our office and we're sharing culture, hashtag together we're first team. Uh, but maybe the first open house, do you pay for and put them up in a hotel for three days and say, hey, I need carte blanche in order to have an effective initial round of showing. It's worth the $500 for me to pay to have you get out <laughs> and position it as a positive. 
because doing open houses, we all know it's stressful. Isn't it worth maybe going to La Quinta for a weekend, you know? Then how do you field and negotiate offers? Both on the listing side, but also, of course, on the buyer side. But do you have a process? Let's say you have 15 offers. Do you have a way to effectively field, review, and present 15 offers? That's hard. System number seven, buyer conversion. Do you have a solid buyer consultation? Yes, I know this is kind of small. I apologize for that. But hopefully when you see the slide, you'll see it. But do you have a solid buyer consultation that you know how to set up and effectively get a commitment, right? Are you able to effectively communicate the current market conditions so that way a client is prepared and ready and willing to write a great offer? It's not just getting the commitment. I know a number of agents who have a ton of buyer broker agreements, but still have challenges converting them to a sale. Because maybe they're great relationally, but maybe they're not effective on educating them on the market on what it really takes and asking for their buy-in. Because just because a client will write a buyer broker agreement with you, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're a sale. Do you have a system for how you hunt and network to help find properties for clients versus setting them up on an auto search on MLS or Real Scout or God forbid waiting for your client to text you a series of Zillow links saying, I wanna see all of these. Anyone else have clients who've done that? Sent them 20 properties. I wanna see this, I wanna see this, I wanna see this, I wanna see this. And you're like, yeah, it's, it's a, it's a pre-foreclosure, you know, or this one's pending, you know? But if the client's having to rely on doing that, that means something we're doing is broken. Not relying on the MLS to tell us what's for sale, but finding out where they want to move and bringing homes to market. Do you have a system for how you effectively show property? Not just how do you set up showings and do the ideal route by MapQuest or God, that's is it MapQuest even allowed around anymore? <laughs> but through Google Maps, but also while you're showing property, how do you get buy-in or managing buy-in? Getting in with the gatekeeper, how effective are you with communicating with listing agents? We all know they're hard to get a hold of and nobody wants to talk, but that's our job. We're salespeople. We have to find a way to get in with that listing agent. And do we have a good strategy for how to get offers accepted? Because that ultimately leads to an escrow. That's what we all want, or at least closed escrow. So that leads us to escrow process. Do you use a transaction coordinator? If not, holy crap, what are we doing? I really, really sincerely hope everybody's using a first team transaction coordinator. They're a few hundred bucks and they... I think it was, there was something that said that using a transaction coordinator saves you 12 hours per transaction. That is the cheapest way to buy back your time. And you make sure that things get done and you can focus on what needs to actually get done, the effectiveness. Do you have templates, email templates to open escrow? Because I don't know about you, but I know a number of agents who just copy and paste previous emails from previous ones and just change words out. Anybody ever accidentally send one before they change the details? Yes, I'm speaking from personal experience. <laughs> uh, do, you, do you have a system for how you schedule inspections? Do you have a go-to inspector that you can call? Do you do a good AVID? Oh my goodness, we are being taken to task over our AVIDs recently. Do you have a good strategy for AVIDs? Uh, negotiating requests for repairs. Do you let the client just ask for whatever? Do you prep them for inspections? Do you prep them for repairs? When you get one on the listing side, are you able to manage expectations? How are you able to get that done? Because that's one of the gnarliest phone calls that I get from agents who are frantic saying that the deal is going to fall out because they're afraid of this request for repair. Do you have a process for filling out as a listing agent? and reviewing as a buyer's agent, the disclosures. Do you do it before the property's even in escrow? So you're aware and you can help plan things out or do you just let your TC send them a glide link and when they don't fill hardly anything out, you just send it to the other side. And then five days before close, 
you find out, oh yeah, I forgot this has, wasn't been working. This has never worked since we've moved here. And now all of a sudden that opens up a loophole. What's your systems on contingency timeframes, holding buyers to timeframes, but also leveraging timeframes. The final walkthrough, oh my goodness. Anybody else have a problem at a final walkthrough? Like, oh my goodness, the, the water heater has been leaking all over the place. How do you ensure that repairs were done as they were properly supposed to? Do you do a last minute check of what things are included and excluded? Do you refine timeframes for when the closing and possession happen? Lining up SPRPs and COPs and SIPs and RLASs. Do you have that process down? System number nine, do you have a customer loyalty process or system? I think that's a huge missing piece because we've all seen the statistics. It's always something along these lines that 88% of clients say that they would use their agent again, but only 13% actually do. We've seen those statistics all over the place, right? It's built first on phenomenal customer service throughout the transaction. I want to give uh, Sam Chenarian from the Irvine office a huge plug. I see him post a lot on social media and he'll drive to his client's houses or to their house with his, the back of his car filled with boxes and tape and Sharpies to help them with their move. Do you do something as simplistic as go on Amazon and buy packets of stickers that just say kitchen, bedroom one, bedroom two? It's things that the clients forget about. Are we planning in advance for what clients often think about? Because this is maybe one of three times in their life that they may move, but we do this every freaking day. And the true relationship is built after the close. How many of our clients have we not even called because maybe it was a difficult transaction, right? Gifts along the way, not just at closing because that's expected. How many of you send little trinkets along the way? Maybe a congratulatory, you've opened escrow. If you want examples of this, look at the, there's a service called Client Giant. I'm not saying to use their service. It's quite expensive. It's valuable, but it's great to get ideas as an example. When they open escrow, maybe sending them a series of de-stressing related items like a head massager, some de-stress herbal teas, maybe a free uh, you know, massage envy coupon or whatever to say, hey, congratulations on opening escrow. It's totally normal to start getting stressed out. Just know that I'm here for you. Something along those lines, right? As an example. A continual communication after the close through those multi-channel approaches. Do you add them to your SOI campaigns afterwards to ensure that they continue to get uh, uh, communication from you? And do you do customer appreciation events? Do you get everybody together? Uh, could you imagine a room full of people all sharing stories about how awesome you are, reinforcing how awesome you are, getting everybody together, maybe pairing it with your farm event that you may or may not do. Maybe pairing it with invites to your potential sellers or potential buyers. Because you imagine people who are thinking about interviewing multiple agents and they're surrounded by 20, 30, 60, 100 past clients all saying, oh, they have you have to use them. They're the best, right? Make them feel like you care about them. And I highlighted feel because oftentimes we do care about them. They just might not feel it because we're so busy doing the day-to-day -day stuff that we forget about this effective stuff, if that makes sense but make them feel like you care about. I don't mean that in like a narcissistic way where like make them feel like it, but you don't really. I mean, we all care about our clients, but are they feeling that level of care? Number 10 is what's your system around your mindset? I believe that mindset is the hidden secret because this freaking business is hard. Can we just like take a moment to acknowledge that? Like it is hard. 
we have to take 100% personal responsibility for our own success or our own failure. It's easy in this business to blame the lender, the other agent, the client that didn't get materials in time. This problem, that problem, the new AB38 that now we have to have these fire inspections, all of these things, it's easy to blame. But to be a business owner, we have to take personal responsibility for our business. I have to take personal responsibility for my office. The leadership of this company have to take responsibility for this company, for things to continue to flourish. Are you taking that level of responsibility with your business, with your clients, with your transactions? Uh, one of the hardest things for us to learn, myself included, is the emotional maturity to detach from the drama of the situation to remain focused and objective in the moment. The client is cursing you out on the phone because they're upset. Do you get right back and start getting emotional with them? Or do you remain that calm center? It's detaching from the emotion to be able to remain objective. Because that ties into our energy management. Uh, Cam is a big believer that this business runs on energy. We have a limited amount of energy. And sometimes we spend those bits of energy in the wrong places. So we're left drained by the end of the day rather than encouraged. But I don't care how good you are at this, you're still tired at the end of the day if you're doing the right things, right? But how do you structure your day to make sure that your energy is not spent on the drama of the business or the drama of the freaking world. How many of us are spending all of this time invested in stuff that doesn't pertain to your business? It might be the business, like what's Zillow doing? I don't care. I care about what my agents are doing. I don't care what someone else's business is doing. I care about what your business is doing. What's happening politically? I don't care. I have zero level of influence. Unless you're planning on going that direction, don't invest your energy in that. Personal thought. Other people have different thoughts. If I want to get political for a second. But self-confidence is a big challenge I sometimes hear from agents is they don't have the belief that they can go into this new area or this belief that they can go to this price point or this belief that they can even do this business anymore, right? One of the things that I've been learning more and more is that self-confidence is really self-trust. And that is earned over time of keeping promises to yourself. Some people come into this business with a delusional self-confidence. Oftentimes they're smacked pretty quick and they get dropped down with the Dunning-Kruger effect, right? Where you think you know what you're doing and then all of a sudden you're like, oh crap, I don't know really anything. And then it's a slow climb of actually knowing something, right? But if you have lower self-confidence, start by keeping your word to yourself on the small things, like what time you're going to get up, how you're going to be eating. Because sometimes all we can control is what we put into our mouth and how we move our body. We can't control what the client does. We can't control if they call us back. We can't control so many things. But are we focusing on we can control, like what we can do today? What outbound activities can we do today? Or are we focusing on what Zillow's doing? Or who's selling what company to whom? Or what have you? And it's the ability to remain calm in the midst of chaos. That's the one skill that I have learned that gets us farther than anything. Because those clients calling us and screaming at us on the other line, sometimes they're a-holes, but more often than not, if we remain calm, if we remain professional, they'll oftentimes call back and apologize. And then you move forward. And we need to constantly cultivate our personal development, constantly. Because in order to get to the next level in our business, we have to take ourselves to the next level. And do you have a morning routine? I don't want to get into the weeds on that, but I will. I'll go through it really quickly. Do you, set, do you start your day the night before? Do you write down what your intentions are? Do you wake up early? That's relative, 
earlier than you would by your own devices, even if it's five minutes early. Maybe rather than hitting the snooze alarm six times, you only hit it five times today. That's a win. Do you bombard yourself right when you wake up by going onto your news media of choice sites and hear about all the things that are wrong in the world? They're never like uplifting stories, right? Do you move your body in the morning? I don't care if it's a walk. Full disclosure, I woke up this morning. I hit the snooze alarm probably five times. It was from 4.30 until almost five o'clock that I finally got out of bed and I just walked. Just walked. I wasn't feeling it this morning, <laughs> but I did it, right? Do you feed your mind with positive stuff? And I don't necessarily mean like positive books or like, you know, Zig Ziglar or, you know, any of those, you know, more positive, but things that feed you what you feel confident about. It could be real estate related. It could be spiritual related. It could be anything as long as it's feeding positive influences into you. Do you review your goals on a daily basis? Or did you do that presentation with Fred a couple of weeks ago and you haven't looked at it since? And start your day from a place of peace and purpose. Nothing is worse than waking up late, being late to an appointment, being stressed, yelling at your kids, throwing them off the car to you know, go to school, and then just getting into this business and starting to make calls to your clients while you're frustrated. Because that's the easiest way to do that. I'll give you guys a bonus for notes, for example. Um, I'm a yellow pad guy. I'm going to be honest. I'm, I'm 34 years old. I'm a techie individual, but I still like yellow pads. Uh, another option that some people like, and I'll hold it up here, large note cards, not the three by five, but this is like four by six or something, uh, having a spiral bound notebook. Um, but what I really love to use is my Apple notes. Um, some people like to use Google drive or one note is another one. Uh, and then Evernote is like the king of notes. It's like your digital brain. That's somebody, somebody will call it. Um, but At the end of this, what I want you guys to have for you is you should end up with your own manual of stop standard operating procedures. Because if your goal is truly to simplify and scale your business, you need to first simplify what you do, which is knowing what you do and how you do it and when you do it. And most of the time, we haven't thought through that. So that way, when you bring on potential team members or want to add a technology, you know what that technology is geared for. It's not just about getting this one technology is going to change your business. What's going to change your business is you simplifying what you do to the most effective core elements and delegating to technology or team members the lower productive activities. But I can't let you guys leave without giving you quick for productivity hacks. Uh, number one, if you haven't utilized your Gmail email templates that you already have with your first team account, do so. Google that if you don't know what I'm talking about. Number two, if you have an iPhone, whenever somebody calls, you have the ability to send them to voicemail, but respond with one of three predetermined messages. I have three. Number one, hey, can I call you right back? That's my first one. The second one for me is I'm on the other line. Can I give you a call back in a few? And my third one is I'm in a meeting right now. Do you mind if I call you when it gets done? Okay, those are my three. You can pick your three based upon you, but those are huge for me. Uh, do you have templates for text messages, like for setting up showing appointments or whatever that you can cut and paste from wherever you take your digital notes? Mine is just on my Apple notes, full disclosure. And do you use Siri, Google, and Alexa to set any reminders for yourself? My wife taught me about that, where she sets it for freaking everything, including like, hey, can you remind me to take such and such out of the oven in 45 minutes? It's incredible. Anyway, I know that's a lot of information, but... Your clients deserve it, and more importantly, you guys deserve it.